Okay, we are continuing to work our way through the New Testament in 2023. What a great thing, going through the entire New Testament. Most lines, um, we're going through four Gospels, and we haven't always been covering every line in the Gospels. But some of these Gospels, particularly the first three, not so much with John, the first three are called the Synoptic Gospels, which means an awful lot of the accounts are the same. Now, not all of them. There are differing accounts. Some bring in an account that another one doesn't. So sometimes we've been, because we've covered it in one, we skip it into the next. And that will happen in this particular chapter. So we're going to get all of the accounts. We're going to get all of this, the stories of Jesus, the things that were going on. But uh, <clears throat> jumping over some of them. So here we are in chapter 7, verse 1. Jumping over them in one gospel but not necessarily in the other. Chapter 7, verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all of this to the people, which was an abbreviation of what's known as the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And it seems like that this abbreviated account, uh, as Luke gives it, maybe Jesus said much more than that. It doesn't mean that uh, Luke included everything that Jesus said. It seems to be maybe in a different place than where Matthew 5, 6, and 7 were, which would mean that Jesus would do the same teaching in different places, which makes absolute sense, right? So when Jesus had finished saying all of this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum, which was the town that he was staying in with his disciples. There a centurion's servant. Well, the, the centurion is a Roman military official who's over 100 soldiers. So they're the centurion's servant, so not the centurion, but the servant, the one who uh, did all of his bidding, whom his master had valued highly. So this guy likes this servant and treats him well and puts an awful lot of confidence in him. A great thing to be able to do with friends and employees and people that we're associated with, be able to value them highly was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him. Now, this centurion, apparently he's friendly with some of the Jewish leaders because he sends these Jewish leaders to go and ask Jesus something. So he must have had some kind of friendship or at least good collegiate relationship with these guys. <clears throat> and he asked him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and he has built a synagogue. And so Jesus went with them. I don't think Jesus went with them because of their pleading and because of them building up his reputation and his um, resume. I think it's because Jesus goes and heals people. And so he's going to go to this Roman centurion this non-Jewish person, you remember Jesus came to the house of Israel first. Now it would go to the Gentiles, but he came to the house of Israel first. But he's going to go to the centurion's house and uh, <clears throat> heal this man. And he wasn't far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him. So he's not far away. He's on the way. And he sends these friends to say, don't trouble yourself, for I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. That's why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. Now this is the message that he's sending to Jesus. He said, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one goes and he goes. I tell this one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does this. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I have not found such great faith in all of Israel. This guy understands authority. He understands the, chains, the chain of authority. Then the men who had been sent and returned to the house found the servant well. So it seems at this place, Jesus heals the guy from a distance, which is an important consideration in healing that Jesus uh, heals from, from a distance. Uh, this might be very similar to what happens when we pray for people. Uh, we're praying to Jesus. We're praying to God through Jesus. We're uh, praying that God would uh, send the, the Spirit to heal them. And he does, even from a distance. They're not in the same room with us. They may not even be in the same town with us. But Jesus understands that this guy under, has a concept of authority. And that G he sees that Jesus has authority and that Jesus can use that authority. So, verse 11, soon afterwards, sometime after that, Jesus went to the town of Nan. 
And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. So not only are the disciples following, but all kinds of other people are following Jesus as well. Hoping for what? Um, hoping to hear Jesus teach. Uh, maybe hoping for some healing. Uh, maybe just to see uh, what's, what's going on. But a lot of people are following him now. And as he approached the town gate, because these cities were often walled cities that had gates, as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. They would uh, bury them outside of the city. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Now, this is a sad story. It's a widow and her son has died. And this widow would probably really be depending on this son to take care of her because that's just the way it was with division of duty that the, the men did the difficult work of gathering and hunting, those kinds of things, and the women were doing the domestic work. And so now she's sort of stuck. She doesn't have a, doesn't have a man in the house. And in the ancient world, it's a very, very difficult situation. And a large crowd from the town was with her. So everybody's mourning with her. and She obviously knew some people in town. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. I love that, that Jesus' heart is going out to the single mom. I think Jesus' heart is still going out to the single mom. And our heart should be going out to the single mom. It's, it's quite a difficult thing being a single mom. Don't cry, he said. And then he went up and he touched, um, <clears throat> he touched the bear that they were carrying him on. And the bearers stood still. He goes up and touches it. Those who are carrying him out, they stop. They stand still. And he said, young man, I say to you, no, he's talking to a dead man. <laughs> he's talking to a dead guy. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Wow, that's amazing. I think that Jesus is still giving dead people back to their moms. I, I kind of feel that was my situation. I was, I was dead to my family. I was dead to the world. I was a <clears throat> useless creature. Uh, but Jesus saved me and gives gives me back to my family, uh, gives me back to society, gives, you know, Jesus is still doing this. He hasn't changed. He's still raising the dead. And they were all filled with awe and they praised God. They thought, this is like amazing. And they said, a great prophet has appeared among us. They said, and God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Yes, God has come to help his people. What a wonderful, wonderful phrase. Uh, let's see if we can do this. I think we can do verse 36. Verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So some of the Pharisees are starting to, you know, be curious. We do this often, right? We'll say, hey, you know, why don't you come over? Why don't we have lunch? Why don't we do breakfast together? Why don't we have coffee? Talk about what's going on. So one of the Pharisees had invited Jesus to dinner with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at the table. He's comfortable there, the Pharisee's house. A woman in town who had lived a sinful life had learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, this would be expensive, this alabaster jar of perfume. They would put the perfume as, as something valuable. It would be a way to save your money. They didn't have savings and loans and banks and safety deposit boxes and those kinds of things or digital coin, whatever. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, this lady is moved by Jesus, she began to wet his feet with her tears and she wiped them with her hair and she kissed them and poured perfume on him on his feet. This lady's worshiping at Jesus' feet. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he'd know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, and she's a sinner. This guy doesn't know what's going on. I invited him over to find out if he's a prophet, and he certainly doesn't know a thing because of this woman's sinful lifestyle. He's letting this sinful woman, you know, blather tears all over his feet. He doesn't, he doesn't know what's going on. And Jesus answered him. He said, Simon, that's the guy's name. He said, I have something to tell you. And he said, teacher, tell me. And he said, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debt of both of them. Which one do you think loved him more? And Simon said, I suppose the one who had his bigger debt forgiven. And Jesus said, yeah, you judged correctly. And then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? <clears throat> I came into your house and you didn't give me any water for my feet. She wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You know, they would come in with dirty feet, and washing feet was sort of common. Uh, a host would do that. He said, you didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered, she's not, not stopped kissing my feet. 
You didn't pour oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Well, I, I, I think we've all been forgiven the same. It's just that we do we realize how much Jesus has forgiven us? This woman did. The Pharisee does not yet realize how much she has been forgiven. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guest said to himself, well, who can forgive sin? But Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Grace and mercy. What a great story. And I think that we're realizing the more we go on, the closer we get to Jesus, how sinful we are and how much he's forgiven us. So Lord Jesus, thank you for forgiving our sins. We're very, very grateful. And and Lord, the more we go on, the more we realize how sinful we were. So thank you for what you did for us on the cross and rose again from the dead to give us eternal life. We're grateful. Change our lives, Lord. Amen.